Hello, my name is Matthew Oros. I am a sophomore computer science major at Baldwin Wallace University. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the simulation of emergent behavior. Now this is a really interesting topic and I have a lot to say, so let's get started right away. So first, let's understand what emergent behavior is. Emergence is the process of coming into being or becoming important or prominent. And behavior is the way in which a natural phenomenon or machine works or functions. So, emergent behavior is how interactions come into being. Let's talk about some real world examples of emergent behavior. If we look at small particles, like atoms, you see protons, neutrons, and electrons. And how is it that those fundamental particles can form more complex things such as compounds, molecules, and eventually complex organisms like humans? Those are quite significant leaps. And how does that actually happen? How does the micro scale create the macro scale? And more importantly for this presentation, how can we simulate this? Or can we? We can't, we can, by the way, we can simulate that. So I made a simulation that can show how emergent behavior can occur. How small scale interactions can create large complex ones. And so let's talk a little bit about the rules of the simulation. You can think of it as like uh, you're looking through a microscope down at like a petri dish and you have a lot of different little molecules or particles and these particles in this simulation there's 10 different particles 10 different colors and these colors each interact with each other differently for an example a red particle might attract a blue one and a blue one might attract a red one so they start clumping together but a green one might repel both of them so they tend to stay kind of far apart another thing that's simulated is friction which means over time, if there's no interactions on particles, they slow down. One thing to note is that there is no equal and opposite reaction, aka Newton's third law. This means that particles don't have to give equal and opposite reactions on each other. This allows interactions like a red particle attracting a blue one, but a blue particle repelling it, which lets them kind of like chase each other. Now, another thing to note is that every time the simulation is run, it's completely randomized, which means each of these 10 different colored particles each interact with each other differently. And that's what makes the simulation so interesting. Every time you run it, you get different results. The simulation starts off with particles spawning from the center of the screen. Another thing that happens is that when particles get a little bit too clumped up together, they turn white and then relocate to somewhere else on the screen. That's just so that they don't all clump up in one giant mass, and that's not very interesting. Another thing to note is that when particles exit one side of the screen, they appear on the other one. This is similar to what would happen if you were to print out a flat map of the planet. If you travel east or west far enough, you appear on the other side. That's not because you teleported, it's just because you're flattening out a spherical world onto a flat surface. So you can think of the simulation as a spherical world where particles leave one side and appear on the other because they're just wrapping around the screen. It's really quite interesting and mesmerizing. Um, they form these almost very organic looking creatures. So they kind of move around the world. Over the next few minutes, we're going to zoom in and highlight some of these interesting interactions that occur here. One thing that I really want to cement here is that I didn't program these particles to do anything more than just interact with each other very basically. All these particles do is either attract each other or repel each other, and that's it. And I'll keep bringing this up over and over again. These particles are dumb. They don't do anything else. They they're actually just a little bit more complex than magnets, and that's about it. So let's take a look at some real life cells. Here's a really big cell. One thing that you can note about real life cells is you have uh, like a wall around them and it protects the insides. Of course, this one's just kind of spilled open everywhere which is really interesting. Now let's take a look at the simulation and see how different it appears. Over time, you'll see that formations of cells start to form, such as these two. One of them has a purple inside with a blue surrounding. Another one has a green inside with yellow in the middle and blue around the outside. This is really interesting. And if I had to guess what was happening here, it's probably that if we take a look at the purple one, that the purple colors attract each other so they all clump up, and the blue ones attract the purple but kind of repel each other, which leads them to form this kind of uh, shell around the outside. 
But again, that's just me guessing. It just kind of happened that way. I didn't tell them to form this, it just happened. We can take a look at another example here. These are, I think, a lot more interesting. They seem to have a lot more layers. Like one of them has green on the inside, then blue around it, and then these orange and pink around them. Uh, another one is red on the inside with green, and then red and orange. And you can see they're very, like, circular. They're very regular. And as you can see, I'm, I can actually push them closer to each other, and you can see that they don't collide with each other very well. They seem to kind of repel each other and retain their structure even as I move them around. This is pretty interesting because this is very similar to how cells in real life work. You can see that these two opposite kinds here don't want to combine, but as I bring these two that are very similar, they combine into one big one. It's quite interesting. Now let's take a look at something called gliders, or I like to call gliders. Um, these are creatures that I classify as ones that, instead of just kind of sitting there, they move around quite a lot more, it's almost like they're seeking something out. We can see an example of that one here. It's just kind of wiggling around, very active. Now let's take a look at the simulation. Another aspect of this simulation in particular is how homogenous it is. You can see that all the gliders typically have this pink front to them and a green tail trailing behind them. Uh, you can also see that they're quite symmetrical and you'll find that a lot of these uh, formations that occur are symmetrical, which is very similar to how real life organisms look as real life organisms are very symmetrical. If I had to guess what was happening here, it's probably the pink ones are attract each other, the green ones attract each other, so they clump up. The pink ones are repelled by the green, but the green attract the pink, which kind of leads to this chasing behavior and forms these gliders that move around the map. But again, that's just my guess. It's not what I told them to do, it's just what happened. We can take a look at another example here in this particular seed or starting point. Uh, it's less homogeneous and a lot more variation is happening. But again, there's only 10 different particles compared to like how many, however many elements in the periodic table and then however many molecules and compounds those form. You know, there's a lot of variation in real life. It's a lot more limited in this simulation, but still a lot of variation does occur. This is probably the most interesting part of the simulation. This is cell reproduction. In fact, this is mitosis, um, where two cells, uh, well, one cell grows big enough for it to split into two. This is a real life uh, cell splitting, uh, although this is sped up by 2000%. So this is quite a slow process in the real world, but I would say this is probably arguably what makes life life, right? It's the reproduction, living and reproducing. What's more lifelike than that? Now let's go to the simulation. If you look at the top right where the particles spawn, you'll see uh, quite a big uh, glider start to appear and then uh, travel across the screen. You'll see, see it appear up the bottom of the screen, then wrap around to the right, and there you go. You can see it split into two, and they look very similar. I mean, it makes sense that they look similar because they formed from the same original organism. I'm calling them organisms, they're, I mean, it's a simulation, but they really look like that. Here's another example. You'll see uh, one of the creatures or gliders moving across the center of the screen upwards, and as it collides with another one, it splits into two. You can see one traveling to the right and one traveling to the left, and you can see them combine again on the left side. Now. What, about, what are the results of this? Emergent behavior can be artificially created. That's what this shows. Even a fictional simulation can produce organic results. Organic meaning that it looks like real life, right? Um, in this case, there's only 2,700 particles in each simulation, 2,700 particles over time. And from what I've observed, emergent behavior is a fundamental property of simple interactions in time. You have enough simple interactions and enough time, more complex behavior starts to form. Now, what are the real world applications of this? Because this is just a simple particle simulation. It's not like I'm simulating real particles like actual elements or like water or gravity. So what is the application of this? And I think it's a little bit more high level than that. And that's the fact that emergent behavior can be simulated on computers. 
And if you look at artificial intelligence neural networks, they actually work a very similar way. You might have heard that the brain is made up of a bunch of neural connections, and these neural connections are stronger or weaker. But, you know, that's not a very satisfying answer. How does that create complex thought? But it's actually very similar to how simple interactions between the particles, like almost like magnetic forces, can create really complex looking organisms. Essentially, simple neural connections can create emergent thought. And this also can be simulated. And this was discovered before even computers were used to do this. But computers are what made it really practical. Emergent behavior can create behavior that is almost impossible for a rule-based system to produce. An example of this is image recognition. If we look at the image here, you can't just say that if one pixel is red and this other pixel is green, then it's a dog. It, it's, it doesn't work like that because what if it's rotated or scaled or tinted a different color? You can't just be so strict. It has to be a lot more nuanced than that. And when you have a lot of neural connections and let the computer almost figure it out on its own by either strengthening connections or weakening them, you get really organic results, organic thinking results, almost like a person. Similarly, how the particles um, were able to form such organic looking organisms. And so in conclusion, this simulation is not revolutionary. It's not here to simulate how life on planet Earth started, but really is to demonstrate how simple interactions can create complex systems. It also shows how emergent behavior can create behavior that is unique from a rule-based system. You essentially let the computer figure out the details itself. And that's where computing is headed, letting computers think more organically, let computers think more like people. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening.